We'll go ahead and get started real quick. Uh, thanks for joining us again today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which you can find by either searching SPEAR on YouTube, or you can go to our website at eepartnership.org and under the news section, you'll find the resources page. Uh, once you're on that resource page, you'll find the link to our channel. Uh, within about 72 hours after today's presentation, you will uh, receive course evaluation email from Kathy Lawrence. Uh, please complete this course evaluation survey and or send this back, the survey back to her. She will actually send you a course completion certificate that will contain the course ID you'll need when using and reporting your CEUs to IECC. Uh, lastly, the chat feature is open. Please use, the, uh, use this to report any technical difficulties or questions that you might be having during the presentation. Also, the Q&A feature is open as well. And we'll be we'll be answering questions as they come in instead of waiting till the end. So let's go ahead and get started with that. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, those that don't know who Spear is, or first time for our webinars and what Spear can do. So we provide training, um, webinars, in person field training, as well as IECC test prep training for any of you out there looking to get certified. Price is always right; it's free. Uh, Spear is one of six Rios. We're listed as a regional energy efficient. Uh, efficiency organization. We're member-based, nonprofit organization. Right now, currently, we have about 50 plus members, edging onto that 60 number we're trying to hope for, with a wide uh, cross section of energy efficiency industries. Our focus is mainly on outreach, education, and collaboration on clean energy and energy uh, reduction on consumption. I can help answer any questions regarding energy code or ASHRAE 90.1. I can help with questions from plan reviewers to, to building officials to third party energy inspectors. I'm always happy to help. Uh, we've also assisted several cities with the adoption of 2021, how to navigate any additional amendments, also make suggestions of amendments that have been taking place in other cities around Texas. My contact information will be at the end of this presentation, so feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Uh, and we'd love to help you navigate through the energy code or any questions that you might have. So on today's agenda, what we're going to talk about today, um, just what is what does code say about for advanced framing? Um, what is thermal bridging? How can advanced framing help? Uh, some of the facts about advanced framing, some of the studies that have been done. Optimal value uh, engineering was another name for advanced framing. The differences between standard and advanced framing techniques. Uh, some of the benefits and challenges. Uh, so we'll look at some diagrams and photos of advanced framing and see some future trends or just talk about some future trends that are coming up and then my final thoughts on it. But before we get started with that, I want to clarify basically what I'm trying to convey with this webinar. Uh, advanced framing is a term that can vary depending on who you ask. It can go from a few framing changes to extreme engineering redesigns of a building. My hopes are basically to touch on, uh, you know, focusing on the few framing changes that can be made and should be done to help improve the overall thermal performance of a building and uphold the goals and intent of the energy code. With that said, I know there are some of these techniques that can't be used due to the structural design and load bearing framing corners and walls. So this is not something I'm advocating to be done uh, 100% of the house. It, it's it, to the best of your uh, engineering plans. You know, if 85% of the house being done this way is better than zero. So the intent is, let's talk about what can be done, a few changes that can be done, even in the field on changes, just to uh, improve overall performance of the walls. So nothing here is code required, um, but instead should be viewed as best practices, something that can be learned and implemented in today's construction with minimal to no additional costs. So what does the energy code say about it? Well, it doesn't directly mention or prescribe any specific construction techniques such as advanced framing, the principles and goals behind these techniques can be contributed and contribute to the building's overall uh, energy efficiency, uh, which aligns with the objectives of the IECC. So IECC can't really come in and ask for you to do specific things, but the way it spells out and defines the way it's to be done, uh, the alignment of the objectives can, be hap can happen with advanced framing. Advanced framing can be a valuable tool for meeting or exceeding IECC energy efficiency standards. 
So before we talk about advanced framing and its benefits, we first have to talk about thermal bridging. What is thermal bridging and what how advanced framing attempts to eliminate or minimize that? So thermal bridging in building science, that's kind of what it's all about is you're trying to keep heat in or out and you're trying to condition the home with minimal energy usage for that conditioning. So thermal bridging refers to the transfer of heat through a pathway that is significantly higher or has a significantly higher thermal conductivity than its surrounding materials, such as wood compared to insulation. These pathways or thermal bridges create a direct connection between the interior and exterior of a building, allowing heat to bypass insulation and contribute to energy loss either in or out of the building. Uh, commonly, um, this occurs at points where materials with high thermal conductivity, such as metal, concrete, actually penetrate or intersect the building's thermal envelope. Uh, and so when that happens, you basically build a bridge uh, and that allows for faster heat transfer in and out of the building. To see that, it's usually easier to look at diagrams or pictures to better visualize what we're talking about. With this, you can see this is showing heat loss from the interior to the exterior, but same is true for heat gain from the outside to the inside which is kind of most of what Texas is concerned with. But as you can see, a thermal bridge can be one thing or several things that create a bridge that connects the interior to the exterior and is, a, is conductive enough to you know, easily transfer heat um, through all those materials. Here we see drywall attached to a stud that's attached to sheathing and or T-ply or OSB, and then it's attached to the siding, either cladding, Brick, brick, there'll be a gap in there. Cladding is normally or like um, hardy board is normally closer to, this, to the sheathing. But as you can see how this works as an example of thermal bridging. So thermal heat transfer happens through the entire wall, but in the cavities, you have insulation that contains air gaps or air bubbles in the case of foam, and that resists heat transfer, but it studs and every stud connection is a direct bridge or connection to the outside. So that's what you're trying to minimize by doing these techniques to change that up. Here we see just a simple technique, not really advanced framing, but it's adding continuous insulation around the home. Uh, it's called a thermal break. Uh, so basically what you're doing is breaking the bridge. You're, you're closing off one side of the bridge. They can greatly improve the thermal uh, performance. Here we see the same wall structure as before, but with a thermal break. Uh, this break is can be just an air gap, or it can be any type of insulation that re resists the flow of heat transfer. With this, we see it's basically a one-inch rigid continuous foam insulation, such as XPS styrofoam foam insulation board being added to the outside. That's kind of an extreme for this condition and climate zone. Normally, what we see is an R3 board, which anything that can break that bridge from that thermal transmittance of heat into the building um, is great. Um, insulation, most of what we see is R13 in the walls. If you take in consideration, which energy modeling does, if you take into consideration all of the studs touching the outside, that overall effective R value diminishes from a 13 to an 11 or a 10 or a 9, depending on which orientation and facing of that wall is happening. So if you could break that bridge you you more you you handle the you're able to increase the ins overall insulation performance and keeping it and maintaining it to that R13, not allowing it to diminish. Uh, common thermal bridges that we find throughout all of the construction, either multifamily or single family, is uh, wall to roof connections using ceiling or four joists that extend beyond the walls to create an overhang, allows for a direct heat transfer into the building. Uh, window and door frames, limiting or removing jack studs, uh, cripples, or any additional sets of king studs can greatly reduce heat transfer around windows and doors, and also eliminating non-load bearing, carrying, or insulating headers to do the same. We'll look at that more in detail a little bit later. Programs like Energy Star even look at framing around windows to limit one pair of king studs, one pair of jack studs, and minimize cripples uh, below and, and above the window itself and or uh, the insulating the headers. Floor connections, similar to roof and wall connections, allowing them to go beyond the exterior wall creates a thermal bridge. 
And then balconies and cantilevers, same thing as the wall, roof, and floor connections. You're, if you're leaving framing members, breaking through that thermal uh, boundary, you're actually building a bridge directly to the outside. And then those are not insulated, so they're not conditioned or insulated. They're allowed to get into the extreme, which is 130, 140 degree temperatures. And that heat transfers directly into the home using uh, those bridges. Uh, and any other structural elements such as beams, columns, or load-bearing framing members that connect directly to the outside, basically it's the same exact thing. It just allows for additional heat transfer into the building. Uh, with this, consequences of thermal bridging, and not only are we talking about heat transfer, uh, but we've got increased heat transfer, changing heat, and cooling loads requiring more air conditioning for the building or more heating for the building. You have lower overall energy efficiency of the building, causing mechanicals to work longer and harder to overcome increased loads of conditioning. You've got potential condensation points. So if you have an area where a thermal bridge is allowing extreme temperatures like 110 or even 100 to be transferred into the building, when it reaches a surface that is in the 70s or 60s, potential condensation points happen, and that's where sheetrock can get wet from the inside because you've got condensation happening around those framing members or other structures being used as a thermal bridge inside the wall. That brings up moisture issues. So warmer air can hold more moisture than colder air. So allowing these areas to transfer heat in, it basically expands that air, that heat around those thermal, uh, the thermal bridges, those framing members, which allows that pocket of air to hold more moisture, which again can now lead to more moisture buildup inside the building which in turn leads to a compromised overall comfort. Um, all of the increases of heat transfer create more discomfort for the occupants. If the moisture in the air goes up, then 72 no longer feels like the 72 that was cooler or not as, not as wet or moist. It's a drier air, so 72 feels colder. But if it's more humid and moist air, then basically 72 starts to feel a little stagnant or uncomfortable. The thermostat in turn gets turned down to compensate for that. And of course, that just increases the energy consumption in the building. So looking at some of the pictures and going through some of some of the real world things that we see out there in a dr more, more dramatic style, I know some of this stuff is kind of, um, it's out there, it's way beyond, most people won't even do this type of framing. But here we see the bridging is being completely eliminated by doing a double stud wall. It's two two by four walls with 16 inch or 24 inch on centers. They are standoffing from each other with a gap in between it. Uh, this completely eliminates any uh, bridging in between. So no direct connection. The base plates don't touch. The top plates don't touch. They're probably air sealing the gap at the top. Uh, we see this a lot with multifamily or townhomes. They build this type of wall for a fire break but it turns into kind of the same thing. Of course, there is no unconditioned space on the other side of that building. They're tied together for conditioned spaces, but it kind of looks the same in the framing, which means it can't easily be done. It's just not normally seen out there. Uh, but this, two, this style here basically separates top and bottom plates and leaves no thermal bridge connecting to the outside wall. Uh, another way to do this is also using the same or a wider base plate and top plate and then staggering the studs. So here we see a 16 inch on center wall, but it's two by four and it's staggering each of those. And so if you stagger each of those, then you can get uh, insulation woven in between those. And there's really, other than base plate and top plate, there's no direct connection to the outside, um, outside wall. So this creates a more unified or uniformed R value throughout the assembly. Uh, in this case, the top plate and base plates are a two by eight with staggered two by four studs. The same that can be done, we'll see pictures on the next slide of a two by six plate with staggered two by fours. You're just not allowing as much insulation at the edges of all the studs. Here you can get a complete R13 in the front and back of each of those staggered studs, as well as it's basically an R26 in the pockets where you don't have studs. So this would depend on the R value you want to achieve and the spacing between each stud and the exterior sheathing and the stud face and the interior sheetrock. Again, this is not something that's crazy. It's something that can be done if you just change up a little bit. Uh, here's another look at the staggered studs. This is using some engineered lumber. 
Um, as you can see, the spacing at, from each interior and exterior stud is, in this case, 24 inch on center, but it's creating more of a structural integrity similar to 16 inch on center, just due to the fact that every other stud is staggered within the stud on the other side, kind of still creating that overall effective structural integrity. In order to compensate for this type of system, though, you've got to either increase slab size or you're basically encroaching on the interior condition space. And so this is normally not designed to do this because condition floor space means money. It's dollars spent with just adding a thicker wall and then also in adding additional concrete adds to the cost of the building. Um, but if you're if you're doing your own house, this is the kind of things that are out there. They're more advanced techniques that you can do. You're not really changing the way you do traditional framing, but you're just adding a little bit of tweaking to the framing to allow more of a continuous insulation and reducing thermal bridging to the outside. Here's another shot of it kind of looking at, at it from a, an insulated standpoint on what it looks like. Unfortunately, these techniques are probably never used by most builders just due to the increased cost. Uh, plus, you're either using, as we said, interior space or you're, you have to increase the slab size. No matter how it's done, the goal is to reduce or eliminate thermal bridging uh, and heat flow in and out of the building. So as you can see, it's woven in between the two by four or two by six studs. In this case, you're using two by four studs with two by six base plates. Putting fiberglass in between, you could also do blown fiberglass. You could do cellulose. With that, and if you've added the if you add the addition of uh, continuous insulation like an R3, R5, or an R10 board on the outside, you've greatly increased your R value for your exterior wall in this case. Uh, some other types of constructions that are out there, we don't normally see it unless it's a high end custom home, but there's things called SIPs, which stands for structurally insulated panels. As you can see, it's two OSB boards sandwiched. Um, together with uh, styrofoam in the middle, um, insulated blocks in between them. These are more technical. You have to order them. You have to design the, the house, send them your plans. They have to be numbered and marked. And when they come out, it's kind of like a puzzle pieces. You have to put those together specifically, number by number and group by group, because they have to be designed off-site. Then you've got ICF, which is insulated concrete forms. Uh, these basically are kind of the same, but in reverse. You have styrofoam on the outside. And then you pour concrete down the middle. So what you're basically doing is pouring a concrete wall, but you're adding insulated foam on both interior and exterior of that building. Those plastic pieces in the middle are not very good conductivity of any heat. So that's basically eliminating heat transfer in and out. And the foam that's used has a high enough R value where you're not going to get much heat going into that building at all. And to get really crazy, now we're seeing 3D printed homes. Um, this is a concrete slurry that's actually done. But here you can see an intentional gap is being left in between each of those uh, foam, expanded foam walls or concrete walls. And then what they do is they spray expanded foam in there um, and fill that wall up with styrofoam, expanded styrofoam that's there. So that eliminates the thermal bridging altogether for this type of house. So this is the kind of stuff that Looks greatly futuristic, uh, but it's currently happening with large volume builders, even in Austin. They're actually doing this on site. You guys have maybe seen the YouTube videos that are out there. It's no longer becoming a one-off kind of thing. It becomes more of kind of a proof of concept and how it can be done throughout all of the country to lower the cost of building and then to still keep uh, homes very comfortable with very minimal energy to be used for that. So for the rest of this presentation, I will stick to more traditional volume builders, kind of things that don't really raise costs and in most cases can still help reduce material costs possibly, and then also increase thermal performance throughout the building. So how can it help? So uses less lumber than traditional framing in most cases, uh, allows for more room for insulation, reducing thermal bridging, increasing overall thermal performance. Uh, less material equals cost savings. It can simplify construction processes. Uh, required by some above, above code programs like Energy Star, LEED, NGBS, they require this stuff to be implemented. And it also provides greater adaptability to integrate, integrating new technologies. So we see, and we've talked about in previous webinars, an increase of Energy Star being used because it's a, it's a less expensive and, and an alternative to 2021 um, IECC pathways. It can be used because it's adopted by the state of Texas. 
So Energy Star is being used, but if if a house is being built and it's following Energy Star and it's not necessarily 90% advanced framing, um, it really should not be um, certified as Energy Star. And that's just one of those things where the third parties will verify that. But as a city inspector or a building official that's out there, when you're looking at it, if it's not being done, or even some of your real estate inspectors that are maybe on the call, if you're looking at homes that are certifying Energy Star and you're doing a pre-drywall and you're not seeing these things show up, um, big question mark should go up to say, is it really following the Energy Star program? So that's kind of where a lot of these techniques come from is the Energy Star program, but it's also techniques that should be used on a daily basis just in basic code building houses because it doesn't take much to do it. So some facts about this, according to estimates, the DOE advanced framing techniques can improve the overall thermal performance of a building envelope up to 20% when compared to traditional framing. Uh, the increased performance is due to more of the space for insulation, less thermal bridging due to fewer studs and fewer connections to the outside. In terms of direct energy savings, this could result in a noticeable reduction in the heating and cooling costs. So it depends. There are some people that like 68 degrees in their house. Some people can't do anything lower than 74. So it depends on occupant um, usage of, of conditioning. Approximately 50% of household energy goes towards heating and cooling costs. And then a 10 to 20% improvement could translate to a 5 or 10% reduction in total energy for heating and cooling. So basically reducing it to 45 to 40% of household energy. And these numbers may be a little skewed. They may be on older data that's out there. Most homes now we see are using all 100% LEDs. So that basically greatly reduces energy consumption for the electricity used for lighting. So it puts more emphasis on heating and cooling costs as being the greater driver for energy consumption. Some key aspects to this um, I put on here optimal or optimum value engineering. It's more of a technical term for advanced framing. Uh, it's a method of construction that optimizes material uses to achieve more energy efficiency um, residential buildings. The primary aim is to reduce the amount of lumber used in construction and increase the space for insulation, maintaining its structural integrity of the building. Some key aspects here is like stud placement. So it, it encourages the placement of studs on 24 inch on center. But as we saw earlier, that doesn't necessarily have to happen and you can still get increased performance, but it's redder than the traditional 16 inch on center. Um, this not only reduces lumber, it also increases spacing for wall insulation, has more of a lined framing. So if you're using um, advanced framing, more emphasis is on if you have a two story or roof members that are holding for load bearing, you're aligning the studded framing below to disperse the, the load that's there. So framing elements across the building entirely, entire building are aligned vertically. So this advanced framing is either stacked framing, allowing for more continuous load pathways to the, to the slab or crawl space or beams, improving the structural efficiency and making it easier. That's one of the difficult things of, if a framer's not used to that and they're doing it that way, making sure these things align is, is, is very key. Uh, two stud and three stud corners. Hold on one second. We've got a question. Energy star framing requirements should be a good part. Number two of the following train up. Yes, we can do that for sure. Yes. Thanks, Bill. We, we will do that. I went through the, the energy star stuff. We did talk about advanced framing, but not in detail. So I will go through its checklist. That's a great uh, topic to, to touch on. So two stud corner, three stud corners. So basically there are what's called a three stud corner. It's traditional style, but there's also a three stud energy efficiency corner. We'll look at that in a minute on what it looks like in a diagram, but it can more open the space for insulation, improving thermal uh, performance of the building. You can go to the extreme of using single top plates. If you're using two by six with 24 inch on center, you can go to single top plates. It again reduces lumber, uh, but in walls, roofs, they must align with the transfer of load. We talked about that with the alignment of the framing. Elimination of unnecessary framing. So minimizing or eliminating unnecessary framing such as headers in non-load bearing walls or trimmers under windows and door openings on the top of the window opening, bottom of the window opening and above the window opening or the door openings as well. So trimmers or cripples having that um, on non-load bearing instead of putting headers there, just putting cripples 
on the top or bottom and then not overdoing it with how many pieces of uh, wood is being added to those. Insulated headers, we'll talk about that more in detail over windows and doors are sized to the actual load, meaning it's not just done because that's the way you do every door and window. It's basically done as if it's not carrying load above, then does it necessarily need that, uh, that big size header for increased thermal um, bridging? And, and a lot of times it doesn't. So basically you're reducing the, the actual load. You're not carrying it beyond the opening of the window. And then you've got insulated sheathing, which we talked about. Instead of using OSB or plywood, basically you're using a continuous foam board that increases the insulated value of the exterior wall, reduces or eliminates thermal bridging, and upholds that R13 or greater insulation that's inside the wall. So these strategies allow for construction of homes that are structurally sound, very well energy efficient, more cost effective. However, implementation requires careful design and planning, as well as a strong understanding of local building code requirements and construction best techniques. So, but the, with proper ex execution, advanced framing can significantly improve the overall performance and sustainability of residential construction. So sometimes, again, pictures are better than a story or words. So we'll look at some of this and say, using a color, color coding here, we can see that What's conventional framing or traditional framing? What's advanced framing? What's a combination of the two resulting in greater wall performance? With advanced framing, we can move from a single top plate, single ply headers. In other words, just a one-sided header, not a sandwiched header. Ladder blocking for T-wall intersections, two and three stud corners, and then possibly 24 inch on center instead of 16 traditional. So as we see here, um, if we're looking at it, we see a single top plate, the wood structure panel box, instead of a sandwiched header, they've eliminated one side of it. You can now insulate that portion of the wall. They're using ladder blocking at T-wall intersections and at corners. Instead of actually putting a dead space or channel there that's a, anywhere from a two by four, two by six, I've even seen two by eight uh, plumbing walls that actually have a dead space behind it with absolutely no insulation. So that should not be done in today's construction when just tweaking and turning some of these studs a different way is still upholding the, the structural integrity, but it's allowing for a continuous level of insulation on the exterior wall. We talked about earlier, if you have thermal bridging, it reduces the overall R value of the wall. Now include dead spaces behind T walls, dead spaces in the corner, and then openings for windows and doors, and that R13 wall quickly becomes R8, R7, R6. It can start diminishing really quick, and depending on which way that building is facing and the orientation of the specific wall with that number of openings to the wall and that many dead spaces, that's where a lot of heat transfer can happen into the building and heat up that side of the house, leaving for discomfort of that. So with advanced framing, you can... Um, Looking at these photos, you can imagine eliminating everything, and then you go to a, the, the yellow that's limiting everything that's yellow, and then maintaining the structure of the dark green is showing the more advanced energy efficiency framing. So what are the major differences? We talked about some of them already, uh, but major differences are stud spacing. So advanced framing can use 24 inch on center, or it can even go 16 inch on center, just still with staggered studs. Uh, corner framing, so advanced framing often employs two and three stud corners, allowing for insulation to go all the way to the corners. Headers, so advanced framing headers are insulated in between and or eliminating one side and or eliminating all of the header and just using framing members and using it as a regular framed wall and actually insulating that part of it. So top plate, you can go, you know, again, we talked about it, about single top plates or double top plates. So single can be done, but the emphasis on alignment of the framing needs to be done. And then framing around openings. So advanced framing minimizes the use of framing members around windows and doors. We talked about the king stud, the jack studs, and the cripples, and trying to eliminate the majority of those if it's not load bearing uh, to just handle what's actually there. Um, you got insulation complexity and then material use. So you can cut down on material use as well with advanced framing techniques. But again, understand that not every framing member can be turned into an advanced framing just due to its overall structural integrity or intent of that wall. But remember, while advanced framing can offer significant channel or advantages, 
in terms of energy efficiency and material usage. Its success relies heavily on proper design, execution, and implementation from the contractors. So benefits of advanced framing, most of this is kind of already kind of touched on a little bit, but just lifting them here, can you can easily see what can be used, but using advanced framing techniques offers a full range of benefits from improved energy efficiency, sustainability, cost effectiveness, and overall uh, occupant comfort. But you have energy efficiency, reducing thermal bridging. You've got reduced construction costs, cutting down on your lumber needs, sustainability. Um, you've got advanced framing contributes to more sustainability practices by reducing the amount of lumber, uh, kind of your carbon footprint, the big words that are out there, and also conserving you know, your natural resources. That's another big push that's out there. Homes built with these methods are using or uh, methods are more energy efficient and also reduces the carbon footprint and the overall life cycle of the building. So improved comfort, we've talked about that, but the occupant can stay more comfortable. It reduces the loads needed to condition the home. It allows for flexibility for insulation and system installation. So spaces created by advanced framing can offer a more insulation also more room for plumbing, electrical, and HVAC systems. This can simplify the installation and improve the performance of these systems, like having spacing for better ductwork being run instead of being compromised by framing members. Green building certification. So home buildings with advanced framing may find it easier to meet criteria for green building certifications, such as Energy Star, which is required. And then LEED actually looks at Energy Star for its pathway, and so it's still required. For these homes, a lot of houses being built, if a framer is already doing a great job and doing advanced framing, uh, that builder may not realize how close they are to just getting Energy Star certification on those homes, uh, which can be a selling feature for the house. It could sometimes take very little to no cost just to tweak a few things, and now your home is Energy Star. So durability, since the framing member provides for better efficiency of the load, it can be re uh, a reduction on the building's movement, can minimize cracks in drywall, stucco, and other finishes, thereby increasing the structural uh, durability of the, of the home or building. So some challenges, though. Advanced framing techniques bring several challenges to these, um, such as building code compliance. So not all building codes explicitly recognize advanced framing, potentially leading to issues causing uh, during permit. So if, a, if someone's doing a plan review and they see a different style of framing, they may not understand what it looks like and what it means. It requires a good understanding from those building officials and or plan reviewers um, to be able to communicate those advantages and equivalences of the framing to those building inspectors. Uh, training and education. Advanced framing is different from conditional framing. So there's more of a learning curve involved in design from designers to builders to subcontractors. It requires education and training to ensure everyone's involved and understands the techniques that can be implemented for them to be correct. Uh, planning and design, advanced framing also requires more planning and design, of course. And then trade resistance, some, some contractors, plumbers, electricians, drywall installers don't like using these other techniques because they don't like, as we'll see in just a minute, the techniques of using drywall clips as opposed to using wood. So some of them resist part of that. They don't want to deal with it. There may be callbacks because of cracked corners uh, and they don't want to have to deal with that. So perception and market acceptance, there may be a perception of reducing lumber as equivalent to lower quality or less durable construction. Even though that's not the case, educating consumers and overcoming those perceptions can be a challenge. And then potential moisture uh, problems. So if not done correctly, some components like insulated headers or corners may risk moisture condensation. Uh, which can potentially lead to issues um, such as structural damage or growth. So it's important to consider these challenges and plan when deciding to use advanced frame techniques. Despite some of these potentials, uh, the benefits of energy efficiency, cost savings, and sustainability can make advanced framing an important strategy for modern uh, residential construction. So some examples here, we'll go through some diagrams and some actual pictures. So here's a quick comparison of traditional corner framing on the left compared to a two stud corner on the right. But as you see, the two stud corner is using a drywall clip. It doesn't have an additional framing member that's on there. So that's why it's considered a two stud corner and the way it's actually framed here 
A lot of framers and builders don't trust the drywall clips, as we said a while ago, contractor resistance. So instead, they take the two stud corner, turn it into a three stud corner. But what they're doing is actually turning one of the studs a different direction, allowing for the drywall to be secured in the corners. So it builds a longer, uh, it can build a longer thermal bridge here by just adding that additional stud, but it adds the structural integrity back to the corner of the wall while still eliminating the dead space and allowing for insulation to reach the corner of the wall. So that's a more unified insulation around those corners instead of leaving a dead space. So here we're seeing more diagrams of just what a two stud corner looks like. <clears throat> The top diagram is showing ladder blocking being used. So not only are they have methods of using a two stud corner, you can also do ladder blocking in those corners, which is just one stud and then ladder blocks come out. You can have insulation going through there and then you stud the next one over. It's still cutting down on and eliminating the dead space with no insulation. And at the bottom left shows this techniques being used for uh, basically the drywall clips to support those corners. And then you've also got wall panelization, kind of how they're doing it. If you're actually doing um, a SIP panel or something like that nature, if it's already got OSB to it, you can run those together and still have insulation going all the way to the edge of those corners. This is what a drywall clip looks like when we keep mentioning, I keep mentioning the words drywall clips. These are the metal clips that actually get affixed to one side of the, of the sheetrock. And then the other actually has the lip there with the three holes in it. That's used to actually anchor the screws. And so that will hold that uh, sheetrock there. Those are pretty sturdy. They're made out of metal. They're pretty sturdy. They resist bending at those points. But again, if it gets pushed heavily on that corner by uh, uh, furniture or someone else in the room, someone leans on that corner, it could pop in those certain areas. That's why a lot of builders resist the, the, the corners with drywall clips and they go with that three stud corner variation, um, eliminating the dead space, but allowing for that stud to be turned to anchor those uh, sheetrock and screws. This is showing that same thing we saw a second ago, but it's the three stud corners, sometimes known as California corners. I don't use those words because it's Texas, we're not California. So it's the two stud and three stud corners. As you can see on the left, um, we've got a three stud corner, but not like conventional on the right. And it's just turning that other stud the other direction and eliminating the dead space. That's still upholding the structural integrity of the wall in that corner, even if it is or isn't a load bearing corner. Um, it's the way that they're actually turning that. And then you can also, there's an alternate to that, again, using clips by using three studs and then clipping one side of that to eliminate the other one that's coming through. But that's that's there's variations to it on how you want to do it um, and, and how it can be done, but it's just a it's a learning curve to be done that way. Another view looking at it from an insulation standpoint, if you look at the left and you see a channel or a three stud corner with over framing and putting too many studs there, you're compressing or eliminating insulation in the corners. On the, and that blue line or the blue arrow coming in is a representation of heat transfer through the corner. So it has a lot of thermal bridging that's happening at those corners. Whereas on the right-hand side, you have almost a full set of insulation all the way to the back corner. On both sides, there's only one bridge coming in, which is eliminating that thermal bridging or minimizing thermal bridging. And now that blue arrow is not actually making it all the way into the house. So it's reducing the heat increase inside the home from thermal bridging. So with this diagram, there's a lot going on. There's several points that are being made, but starting at the top left, you've got raised hill trusses. We'll look at that again in a, another slide in uh, a little bit further down. So raised hill trusses are also known as energy trusses. These allows for a full amount of attic insulation to be installed all the way to the outer edge of the top plate. So in code, it says, if your climate zone requires R49, but you can get 100% of the insulation all the way to the outer edge of the top plates, you are now allowed to drop down to the next climate zone level, which is R38. So it can save the builder money, but you're still now putting more money into raising those trusses or roof members up off the plate to allow for an uncompressed insulation at the corner. Um, it, it's 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 a give and take with that part, of it, but it's a full covering of insulation to the edge. 
And then we see no headers or on non load bearing walls. This is an example of eliminating the header and just going with what looks like a standard framing wall. And you can now insulate that to a full R13 in those cavities. That can happen over windows and doors that don't have any load bearings above them, eliminating the need for those headers. And then you got single stud at open rough, at the open rough ends. They're going singles top plates on that part of it. And then around the windows, you see an elimination of additional framing, like adding another pair of kings or another pair of jacks because they feel like that's a, a needed. And if it's, if it's looked at from an engineer and they realize it's not needed for um, uh, weight distribution, then you can eliminate those additional studs, the kings and jacks. And then there's no cripples or very little cripples underneath the windows, reducing thermal bridging. Then you've got two stud or three stud corners happening, reducing thermal framing or thermal bridging. And then you got single header. So instead of a sandwiched header, and a lot of them are either filled with just nothing or it's filled with OSB, adding to the thermal bridging, um, you're eliminating one side of that. Again, looking at an engineering plan and asking them to look at load variations and, and how it's actually being carrying the load. If it doesn't have to have a sandwiched two two by four or two two by tens or two by twelves, you can eliminate one side and actually insulate one side of that. And then you've got point load. So it's aligning the frame members, as we said earlier here, since they're using advanced framing, they're making sure each of the floor and ceiling joists meet and align with the top, with the studs for better, better distribution of those loads all the way down. And then uh, Bill's got a question. Do you know if the engineering framing wood product materials are manufactured to resist heat transfer? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think they are. I mean, basically what they are, are just shaved pieces of wood with a rosin in the middle and they're formed to, to develop studs. I don't, that's a great question. I don't know. I'll look that up. I don't know what its uh, conductivity is, whether it reduces heat transfer or not. But that's a great question, Bill. Thank you. And then roof framing, again, we just talked about that, but it's more aligned with load transfer directly to the uh, studs all the way down uh, to, the, to, the, to the ground. And then here, kind of some real world look at it and kind of how it's being framed. We see the right sized headers. So they have eliminated header above the window. And on the right window on the right side, they've actually eliminated one side of the header. So it's not a sandwiched header. So you can fully insulate that pocket. Uh, it's 24 inch on center. Uh, it doesn't look like they've yet, they still used a double top plate at the top. So again, it's it's varies. It, you can use all techniques or some techniques to get the benefit that you need. Um, another detail looking at that part of it is um, windows falling on that two foot outlay. So if you have a 24 inch on center and you design the house properly, well, then that window with its framing are going to fall on that 24 inch on center spacing. Uh, eliminating additional studs now that you're doing the framing around the window, your two by four or two, a 24 inch on center may not line up with that. And now you're adding additional studs and thermal bridges around the windows because the window is bigger than that opening between there. So it just takes a lot of planning ahead of time uh, to make sure that you've got windows that are the right size of what the occupant wants, what the homeowner wants, but it aligns with the framing members. So there's very little additional studs being added to the wall for that same process. So here's another diagram detailing those elements. You see single top plates, and then they show plates of how they're connected. Since they're not double, you don't just double them up and, and, and have um, like a misalignment of the spacing. So if you have the structural integrity of a double top plate, single top plates will have to use connector plates to hold those together. And then you've got the uh, header. If you can eliminate one side of it, you've got a single, and now you can insulate the inside of that. And then they show drywall clips, the two stud and three stud corners, ladder blocking as well uh, for those advanced framing techniques. And here's kind of a, this, if anybody's been on the Build America website, this is kind of the EPA's version of this is thumbs up, you did great. This is showing T-wall intersections and corners using ladder blocking. Uh, you, now that you can get insulation directly behind those with Energy Star, these things are a must. That's why it's on their checklist. Uh, and this is directly off the, the energystar.gov website that illustrates the do's and don'ts of the Energy Star for Homes program. 
Looking at this, though, this is one thing that when you bring up ladder blocking, some of them say, we know what that is, we know how to do it, and then their techniques are a little bit different. So here, both of these pictures technically meet the definition of ladder blocking and meet the intent, sort of. They're eliminating that, that, that vertical stud or, or dead space channel behind the T-wall, uh, but all they really did was they turned those studs, the horizontal studs, the ladder blocking, they've turned them on their skinny side, not on their, their longer side or wider side. And so it's basically adding now the same equivalent to a stud going down the wall. You've now added those thermal bridgings to that pocket. So technically they're meeting the intent, but they could be done better if you actually use the one on the left and turn the framing members uh, with the, the wider side facing out that eliminates thermal bridging at those T-wall intersections altogether. And how that also can come into play is if you have a, just if you visualize, the, visualize this, you have a dead space behind there, you've got wires and or plumbing members going through there. Yeah, you've got poly sill there, but if that dead space is directly behind that stud, it's transferring heat directly to that last stud, which in turn is also transferring more heat inside of an uninsulated cavity behind tubs or interior walls of a building. It's just adding more and more heat transfer. There's no resistance. Once it passes that first stud, there's no resistance for heat and no slowdown of heat by using insulation so that it's just being allowed to run into an, uh, a cavity that's uninsulated. So having that, where you can have insulation behind is eliminating the transfer of heat down those uh, T-wall intersections. Here's another visual look of just kind of what it looks like if you're going to sandwich the header, which is what they're doing on the top, is sandwiching the header, putting R3 board as opposed to empty space or OSB. They're putting an R3 board, which is half inch thick, which meets the actual width of a sandwiched header. And then below that, they're actually eliminating one side of that header so that you're allowed to insulate um, in front of that. And you're getting almost the insulation value of the walls behind it uh, or the walls next to it and adjacent to it. There's different ways to do part of that. Here is more of a, a diagram look of kind of what a raised hill truss looks like. On the left, you have conventional truss systems versus the one on the right using a raised hill or energy truss. Uh, this technique and um, with this technique, the climate zone required insulation can be installed all the way to the edge of the installation. So as you see on the right, minimum required R38. They're getting it all the way to the outer edge of that top plate. If the requirement was 49, code allows them to now do 38 because they're not getting compre sorry, compressions or you're not getting a void of insulation over a top plate if you're using traditional or conventional truss design like you see on the left-hand side. The last 18 to 24 inches, depending on the um, slope of the roof, you have a reduction of insulation. That's why a lot of people see the new codes come out and there's, a re there's an increase of R value in the attic insulation. One of the reasons why people talk about that and ask for and propose more insulation in the attic is because around the edges of all the standard truss built roofs or hip roofs that are being done, all the way around, you have diminishing R value all the way to the top plate. And so if that's happening, your overall effectiveness of the attic R value is not the intent of 38 like the code is intending it to be. The reason they go to 49 is because the overall R value of the attic with this reduction of insulation on the edges is now brought you back to a level of overall effectiveness closer to 38, which is kind of what the intent of code was. But it's, as we always say, it's up to interpretation. And if you read R38, well, then they're going to put R38 without the understanding that the last two feet of everything around the attic itself is not 38. It's more like 35 all the way down to maybe nothing because you've got exposed top plates. So doing a raised till trust, they give you a benefit of, well, if you're going to do that, then you, you're allowed to go back on the next uh, R value that's proposed, which is basically the next climate zone down. Lowest we now see is R38 in climate zones. We don't really see a 30. And the reason is because they've increased all of that because you've got so much more reduction happening around the edges. It's kind of like keeping a blanket wrapped over you and not letting part of your legs get cold from being exposed to colder air. It's You have a more unified blanket all the way around the house.
So if I'm building a house, uh, you know, I'm looking at the cost effectiveness of this and like what's the traditional framing compared to what's an energy trust framing look like and look and weigh the, the aspects of, I know insulation is not expensive. So going 49 is not, it's cheap. So not doing energy trusses or raised tilt trusses and trying to compare that to the addition of insulation, there's no comparison in cost. Insulation is always going to be cheaper. However, the comfort of the home and the reduced loads inside the house and possibly reducing tonnage being used for conditioning also has to be taken into account when you actually have this increased blanket of insulation around the homes. So with today's construction, though, if you're looking at traditional on the left hand side, if a baffle is being not being used in every cavity, which 2021 code now requires baffles to be used in every cavity, not just adjacent to vents. Uh, but if older code is being used still 2015, 2018, and you've got baffles only where vents are, well, then all the others are getting wind washing and blowing insulation off those top plates building up to more heat load inside the house, allowing for more thermal bridging to happen inside the attic and moving inside the home, making the home not as comfortable or energy efficient as it should. So some advanced kind of framing uh, future trends possibly. This just goes with that we, as we look at it, the more computer processing that we have, you've got more integrated design software. So now you could possibly take a traditional framing house and you put it into a different software and it can redesign using what's called building information modeling, a BIM. It can do a more energy efficient design with planning and implementing implementing uh, advanced framing techniques. And it'll actually, it can spit out just like they do now with other framing plans as they fit, they spit out how much framing you need, how many two by fours you need, how many this, how many that you need, how many four trusses or a, Ceiling trusses, you need floor trusses, you need uh, all the framing members get put into a column to, to, to know what the cost of that building is going to be. But as these design softwares get smarter, they can take what we currently do and tweak it to A, save costs in building materials, and B, make the house more robust and more energy efficient and more sustainable and more resilient as we go through. And then automated construction, so advanced and automated robotics, we've seen 3D printing. Uh, if you see on, on the YouTube, there's a lot of them out there. There's 3D printing that's happening, but there's also other ways to build what we would call stick frame building, but they may be having te uh, technologies coming up that's help uh, robotics will build those and they'll build them more precise, uh, build them more energy efficient, have more load carrying capacities on there. So you can have the spans that are bigger to allow for more insulation. And then you've got net zero homes, uh, net zero energy. That basically net zero term means you're, per, you're consuming or you're producing as much energy on site as you're consuming. Therefore, the wash is net zero. So if your house used, I'll just use dollar amounts. If your house used $2,000 a year to condition the home, heating and cooling and water heating, um, if you produced a lot of $2,000 worth of energy by either means of solar or wind or geothermal, then you've got a wash of net zero. The goal with IECC is to kind of have a net zero ready home uh, by 2030. And that's kind of where codes are going or they're progressing is as they tighten all these things up, eventually a home that's being built will only have to add a few thermal, uh, solar panels or maybe a wind turbine or two, and then suddenly you're down to net zero. So getting the energy consumption already down to its lowest levels without compromising comfort and then you just add a few renewables on, and now you've got a net zero home. That's their goal in the future. And as we talked about 3D printing, uh, and then prefab and modular is actually making a big comeback. Um, there's, there's, from what I've been reading and what I've been seeing is modular and prefab homes that are being built in a factory and then put together on site uses advanced framing techniques, which actually enhances the energy efficiency and resiliency and sustainability of that construction. It's still adding to the durability and the look and the aesthetics that a homeowner wants, but it's allowing the house to A, be built a lot faster, a lot quicker, but it's still not, it's not doing it in means of um, reducing energy efficiency. It's actually increasing that. That's their big goal is to make sure they're doing prefab and modular that already meets future goals of energy efficient houses and even net zero.
And then increasing code requirements, we just talked about that, but the IECC continues to push. Um, as we see now, 2021 asks for 100% high efficacy lighting. There's not anything better than 100%. So instead, we're going to ask you to have occupant sensors or timers or dimmers that reduces the, the time of usage uh, to reduce energy. That's the only other way that they're going to be able to do it. So that's why those things are coming into the code. And then enhanced education and training. So as the construction industry uh, acknowledges the benefits of advanced framing, we can expect, uh, expect a rise of education and training programs focused on these techniques. So someone like me or another organization or nonprofit that's out there puts training on like this all the time. I know the, the APA and, the, and the, the wood associations out there, they actually do, the lumber associations do the best to try to curb some of that. We've got the engineering manufactured lumber that's coming out to save lumber um, and doing the best to try to hold down costs. But remember, the overall goal of these trends uh, is to build homes that are not only structurally sound, but they're energy efficient, cost effective, environmentally friendly. And the future advanced framing in residential construction is promising and will continue to reshape how we think and how buildings are being built in today's houses. So my final thoughts on this, again, not code required, even though advanced framing is not a code requirement, it only makes sense that with a few tweaks to our current traditional style framing, uh, we could send the increase of energy efficiency in a house by as much as 10 to 15%. So why aren't these being done on every house that we see being built in America? It mostly comes down to, A, it's not required, uh, B, training and acceptance by the framing contractors and or builders that hire those framing contractors. If they don't have a communication or, con or conversation with them about what's expected, you'll hire a framing contractor and they'll come in and do what they've always done. So when they're left to their own devices and left to their own means, they'll continue to frame the same way that they've done with other home builders out there. And if you just took the time to show them a little bit of a difference on what it can make to the overall comfort and energy efficiency of the home, adding these tweaks is a no-brainer. So for those builders that better understand the building science behind it, uh, they will require that their buildings and their contractors uh, build to those standards, and they will provide the training that helps move them into the next level of energy efficiency construction. So that's my thought. That's my soapbox. This is one thing I've always looked at when I was a building uh, inspector for energy. So as I looked at them from an energy standpoint, you can't change what's already there. So I would not ask them to rip out wood and make them change anything. It's a conversation to be had with the builders and the designers of their plans to say this should be done a little differently to uphold the thermal performance of the outer uh, thermal boundary of the home. Um, and it does not usually take any more costs and it doesn't really take anything more than just additional training to make these adjustments. So with that, I appreciate you guys joining me. Our next webinar is we've got our part two of Stucco uh, from Jeff Adams. It's coming up next Monday. So, and also on June 20th. And I know we've probably touched on this, but I want to go through it again. It's more of a deep dive of the table R402.4.1.1 which is the building thermal envelope requirements of the 2021 IECC. So we'll go through that and kind of break down each one and just talk about each one, what the intent was, what they actually mean by that. Again, code is always up to interpretation. So people read it one way and then others read it a different way. But to look at that, just kind of talk about it from an energy inspector's point of view of what that is supposed to mean and what the intent is and how that's implemented in the field. So again, thanks for joining me. And if you have any questions or if anybody's got any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, you, can, you guys can use my contact information, screenshot it, take a picture of it with your phone. Don't hesitate to reach out. You can email me at any time, phone call at any time. I usually filled phone calls all day long. When I was with energy inspector manager, I was used to answering calls multiple times an hour. Uh, now my phone doesn't really ring. So call me anytime. We can talk about it. Look at the intent. Uh, kind of how it's read. And if if you want to send me photos, you can send me photos to the email and we can discuss, does that meet the intent of code and if there was a better way to do it. So again, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Um, we've got Kurt asking in the chat, what is this presenter's name again? Oh, it be right here on the screen now. I went ahead and pushed it through there. Sorry about that. It took me a second to get to the next screen.
So again, thanks guys for joining me. I appreciate it. And we will see and talk to you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend.